Welcome back. Taking a look at some domestic news now, starting with an announcement from the Pentagon that U.S. troops will stay in Syria even after the defeat of the self-proclaimed Islamic State in the country. Secretary of Defense James Mattis told reporters on Monday, quote, our goal would be to set up local security elements that prevent the return of ISIS, while at the same time diplomatically supporting the Geneva process. What better time to ask, does the U.S. public really support never-ending war? A survey conducted this year by the Committee for Responsible Foreign Policy found the answer is mostly no. Results show that, for example, 67 percent of Americans believe that military aid to foreign countries like Israel and Egypt is counterproductive. It found that 67 percent of Americans disapprove of congressional leadership when it comes to war and that 70 percent of Americans support legislation restricting military action overseas. 51 percent of Americans support a U.S. withdrawal of forces from Yemen, while 26 percent were undecided. What's more, a poll conducted by Gallup in April of this year found that 50 percent of Americans did support U.S. airstrikes on Syria. With U.S. support for war in question, earlier today I spoke with the Anti-War Answer Coalition organizer Walter Smolarik and Dr. Wilmer Leone, host of Inside the Issues. Here's what they had to say. Walter, what do you think about the numbers I just outlined? Should the U.S. public's opposition to war be a little bit stronger than that, in your view? Well, one would hope that it was a little bit stronger, but I still think that those numbers um, show that there's really like a potential for a serious mass anti-war movement in the United States. I think that the people in the U.S. oppose war for, for two main reasons. One, because it's unbelievably expensive. The uh, United States Congress just passed a $700 billion Pentagon spending bill, uh, and that doesn't even encompass the entirety of U.S. war spending. There's also the U.S. nuclear arsenal, which is hidden in the Department of Energy's budget. There's also the uh, interest on the debt that was taken out to pay mm -hmm. for the wars. There's the, the VA, right, the people who are sent uh, as cannon fodder into these conflicts you know, they have to be cared for afterwards. And this is a tremendous, tremendous drain on a society's resources, a society that badly needs better schools, that badly needs free university education, infrastructure, roads, bridges, health care, uh, all of that. Mm -hmm. And the other reason, I think, is that these wars never end. They don't seem to ever end. I mean, I was eight years old when the war in Afghanistan started. Uh, the most intense phase of the war in Iraq lasted for eight years, but that's still going on today. And I think that the extreme, uh, brutal, divide-and-conquer tactics used by the United States in the Iraq war is actually the cause of the rise of ISIS. I was surprised, for example, that more Americans didn't support at least U.S. forces withdrawing from Yemen. But then again, Walter, how much do you think the media is responsible for not informing the public properly about these conflicts? For example, Americans might not even know that their tax dollars and their jets are fueling uh, this humanitarian catastrophe in Yemen. Yeah, that's absolutely right. I think there's no way that the um, United States would able to be would be able to wage war all around the world if it wasn't for the support of the corporate mainstream media in the United States. And I think there are two basic storylines that we hear. Um, one is just extreme racism, that the people over there, quote unquote, are dangerous, they're terrorists, they hate us because of our freedom, because uh, of our religion, or you know, some story along, a storyline along that way. Or uh, it could be, well, those poor people over there just need to be rescued, that there needs to be a humanitarian intervention, you know, the softer side of the narrative, that somebody has to do something and because the United States is exceptional, that power must be the U.S. And in just the brief time we have left, in the lead up to the Iraq war, millions of Americans took to the streets to show their opposition to that uh, U.S. intervention. But since then, under Obama and Trump, we've seen less uh, opposition to wars in Syria, in Libya. Where has the anti-war movement gone? I think that the way in which the United States chose to wage war over the course of the past uh, 10 years or so has, has shifted. You know, they prefer to um, make covert interventions. They prefer to use drone warfare, for instance, um, you know, methods of war that don't involve large numbers of U.S. quote unquote boots on the ground, right? That was Obama's mm -hmm. favorite saying, you know, we won't mm -hmm. put boots on the ground. And so I think that does have 
uh, a suppressing effect on the U.S. anti-war movement, but I do have confidence that people will uh, begin to realize just how devastating these wars are, both to our sisters and brothers around the world and to people right here in the United States. We've seen the rise of mass protests uh, all across the country um, for years and years and years, and I think that you know it's only a matter of time before that type of energy makes its way around to uh, to war and the anti-war movement. All right, we'll leave it on that optimistic note. Walter Smolarik, organizer with the Anti-War Answer Coalition, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Hey YouTube, thanks for checking out our channel. We hope you enjoyed the video. We have tons of content for you just like this. For more of RT America's one-of-a-kind news and analysis, be sure to subscribe and never stop questioning more.